Establishing the Levites. Now, why in the world is that important today? We're talking about that and more today as we focus on the book of Numbers. It is great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Ron Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. As we discover the book of Numbers, it's about numbers, and we'll talk about that and more still to come. Janice, or Corey rather, <laughs> what do we do? Well, I'm going to be focusing in on Numbers chapter 2 and the arrangements of the camp of Israel. And we're going to be looking at some surrounding cultures and how it compares. Ryan, what about you? Well, today I'm talking about Ephraim, the man, the tribe, and the nation. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Look forward to that. Janice, what'd you do? Fun Friday wrap up. That <laughs> means that everything from the last week, I can pick from any chapter from Leviticus 9 through to Leviticus chapter 27. There's going to be a question coming in there somewhere. Is it an open book? Sure. Numbers 3 verses 1 through 10. Now these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests, whom he consecrated to minister as priests. Nadab and Abihu had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron their father. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him and they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. Also, they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Numbers chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Why would there be a book in the Bible called Numbers? I mean, what, what are we numbering? Well, that's a really good question. You know, the books of the Bible are fascinating. And when we look at Numbers chapter 1 to 3, we're going to focus today on chapter 3 and learn something from it. So when we look at how God established the priest of Israel, it's helpful to remember that this would have been a new and unusual experience. You see, the Israelites had come out of the culture of Egypt. And while some elements of true worship of God may have mirrored practices that they had seen and participated in, their covenant with God required a change and deep allegiance. Now, it was a serious business as they learned from the deaths of Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons. The people needed to learn the ways of God's tabernacle. And the book of Numbers as a whole also counts the Israelites at the beginning, at the end of their journey, that is to the promised land. But it keeps track of Israel's very real journey and records some highlights among the way, like the rebellion of Korah, for example, and a run in with a questionable prophet who had a donkey who talked to him. <laughs> it's very interesting. Did you know a donkey talked? Well, I tell you, I was in Israel one time and uh, I said that and there was a gentleman with us and he was from uh, Israel and he didn't really know and understand and uh, was not very religious. And he asked our guide, he said, did he say a donkey talked? <laughs> Actually, it does say a donkey talked. And so that's what we're going to focus on. Get your Bible guide and turn to today's uh, passage. If you don't have a Bible guide, you can write to us at the bottom of the screen, or you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you go there, click on a page, it'll say, it'll take you basically to the 
donate site and we want to thank you for making donations in this time a troubling time and a time of uh, a, a lot of change and a lot of things happening but thank you so much for that we really appreciate that father i pray today as we look at establishing the levites and we look at numbers chapter 3 10 verses here and as we take this and focus on it and begin to apply a sermon to it begin to apply a, a thought Help us, Lord, as we focus on this to hear what you're saying and not to apply our thoughts in here, but to take your thoughts from the Bible and apply them in our hearts. That becomes important for us. So help us to do that, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we said together, amen. Numbers chapter three. This is great. Verse one. Here's what the Bible says. Now, these are the records of Aaron and Moses. Now, I love that's how it starts. These are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. That's the mountain of God. That's where we received the Ten Commandments. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron. Here they are. Nadab, the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed or set-apart priest, whom he consecrated, moved to a different location to minister as priest. Now, Nadab and Abihu had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar ministered as priest in the presence of Aaron, their father. Which leads me to this point. Aaron's sons died because they did not honor the Lord's name. We must honor God in all we do. Now, understand that God had given Moses instructions about how to offer fire and how to offer things. And it is, we assume, Nadab and Abihu, we assume here that they did not offer the right thing because that's what the Bible said. They were, in fact, it could be assumed very possibly that they got drunk. And they offered the wrong thing. And they were casually dealing with God that way. And God says, these are holy convocations. You don't casually deal with me. Because my, my times of meeting with you are holy. Holy. And I feel today we've gotten off of that. And God is getting us back to holiness. He's getting us back to the idea that we don't just come to God however we want. But we come to God understanding that he's holy. Very important. Numbers 3, verse 5, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before the Lord, Aaron the priest, that they may serve him, and they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. That's work. You see, God assigns the Levites to serve Aaron, the high priest, and to do the work of the temple, work of the temple, that's work. God uniquely assigns each of us to do the work of his kingdom. I remember talking to somebody and they said, well, I just, you know, I just want to do God's will. And he spent six months and I said, well, what, you know, what have you been doing? Well, I haven't been doing anything. I've been sitting back waiting for God's will. I said, for crying out loud, get a job or do something. God cannot move a boat that's sitting still in the water. But if you start moving that boat, then all of a sudden God can aim you in the direction that we should be. Beloved, we need to work where we have our work and go forward and pray and ask God to help us, beloved. That's what we need to do. Remember that. So let's get on to Numbers chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Also they shall attend to the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and to his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, this is fascinating. Listen carefully. The job of the Levites 
was unique. The job of the Levites was unique. It was not assigned to anyone else. God's kingdom can only be built by God's people. God's kingdom can only be built by people who know God. Now, other people can be used, but they don't know God. They don't understand it. But God's kingdom can be built by the people who truly know him. Are we building God's kingdom? Are you building God's kingdom? Am I building God's kingdom? Are we building God's kingdom? Because that's what we should be doing. Not tied up with what we're doing to get money, but tied up with, are we building God's kingdom? Now, God blesses some and he helps others and he has assignments for each of us, rich and poor. It doesn't matter. We focus on what God wants. Some of us are very wealthy. That's great. Praise God. They know how to handle money. Some of us are not so wealthy, but God takes care of our needs. But we're all Christians and we all love the Lord, beloved. But either way, we are building God's kingdom, building God's kingdom and stand by to build and start building. Just like Nehemiah said, when they built the wall, they, were, they had a sword in one hand and they had the construction brick laying mechanism in the other hand. That's what we need to do. Work, move, happen, build God's kingdom. That's what we need to do. Beloved. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today our assignment is Numbers chapters one to three, in which we read a lot about the tribes of Israel. Now, I thought it would be really interesting to focus in on the tribe of Ephraim today, because Ephraim has a very, very colorful history. And it all begins in the very first book of the Bible called Genesis. Let's study. Ephraim and Manasseh, though the natural sons of Joseph, were later adopted by his father Jacob as his own children. This was highly significant and meaningful, since full sonship granted them each a full share of the inheritance, along with Jacob's other eleven sons. It also meant that Joseph received a double share of the inheritance. Not only were Ephraim and Manasseh given full sonship, but they were distinguished from Jacob's other eleven sons in that they were blessed before any of Jacob's other children, and they were the only grandchildren to receive a blessing. Jacob again breaks the norm when he bestows the blessing of the firstborn, not upon Manasseh, but instead upon the younger Ephraim. This was not unheard of. In fact, for four generations now, younger brothers received the family blessing. Isaac instead of Ishmael, Jacob instead of Esau, Joseph instead of Reuben, and now Ephraim instead of Manasseh. Although Joseph was displeased with his father's actions, Jacob showed prophetic knowledge. It was to be simple historical fact that Ephraim and Manasseh together should be the most powerful component of Israel, but that of the two, Ephraim would be the stronger. Manasseh would be great, but Ephraim would be greater. As time went on, this prophetic act became reality, and though Ephraim the man was now dead, his name lived on through his tribe of descendants, which grew in both size and strength. In fact, his tribe's leadership was already apparent by the time of Israel's wilderness wanderings. In the arrangement of the Israelite camp, for example, it was Ephraim which headed up the three tribes on the west side. And when the time came, it would be an Ephraimite commander, Joshua, son of Nun, who would lead his people into the conquest against Canaan, which ultimately resulted in his tribe receiving one of the largest and most favorable allocations of land. In fact, within Ephraim's territory was Shiloh, which was a religious center where the tabernacle was erected and where the ark rested during Joshua's time. As history continued to progress forward, so too did Ephraim's dominance. Actually, by the time of the judges, the tribe had grown so powerful that it exercised leadership among the ten northern tribes. In fact, only in the time of David does God reject the Ephraimite line due to its sinfulness and replace it with one linked to the tribe of Judah. Nevertheless, when the kingdom split, Ephraim became the most powerful tribe in the north. This was headed up by an Ephraimite official named Jeroboam, 
who became king of northern Israel, and from his time onwards, the center of the political and religious life of the northern kingdom was in Ephraim. So much so was this the case, that the northern kingdom was commonly called Ephraim right up to the time of its fall and deportation under the Assyrians in 722 BC. So Ephraim was the second-born son of Joseph, and his descendants became a mighty tribe, and that tribe ultimately became the largest and main tribe of the northern kingdom. And that's why the Bible later refers to northern Israel as Ephraim. So you had Judah in the south and Ephraim in the north. And one other interesting thing that I wanted to share with you is that the most important and central city within the whole land of Ephraim and Manasseh would prove to be Shechem which would only later be overshadowed by Samaria. And what's interesting is that Jacob may have actually hinted at this particular territory in his prophetic blessing of Joseph in Genesis 49. And Jacob here recounts an event in which he came into possession of, quote, the ridge of land. Now, in the Hebrew, this word is Shechem, which is, of course, identical to the place name. So it could be that Jacob's words were elusively suggesting that Shechem was already in reserve, so to speak, for the newly designated tribes. Now, one last thing to consider is that although Ephraim wasn't specifically named in Jacob's Genesis 49 blessing, it is clear that he was in mind when Jacob blessed Joseph by saying Joseph is a fruitful vine in verse 22. Fruitful is actually a play on words on the name Ephraim itself, which interestingly enough means the fruitful one. You know, the, the, that particular blessing, which is really... I mean, you read that and it's fascinating. Oh, yeah. The 49th chapter is really interesting because everybody is mentioned there. And as you track the tribes and you go forward, you look at it, you see this actually happened. Well, yeah, this is one of the most exciting things, I think, uh, is looking through, following through with all those prophecies that happened in Genesis 49. That is an adventure and a half, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's amazing because he's, he speaks these things. He's a man who is perishing at the time, but he's not... I mean, he's not, the, the idea is that he's had a lot of experience with yeah. life. Yeah, well, he's, he's got a relationship with the Lord, right? He, so He does. Exactly. He does, and, and he's been renamed Israel. Yeah, he's got a relationship with the one who knows the future. So, so it's a really interesting time. Fascinating. Corey? All right, well, in Numbers chapter 2, it's not exactly riveting, you know, when you're reading <laughs> through it. It's a lot, of <laughs> a lot of repetition and a lot of uh, physical instruction for the Israelites. But when it does become riveting for me is when we start to take a look at this organization of the camp as outlined in Numbers chapter 2 and start looking into organizations of other camps from surrounding cultures. What does this tell us about what God was trying to communicate to Israel? Take a look. The Bible meticulously describes the construction of the Israelites' tent tabernacle twice in Exodus. Later in Numbers, the Bible explains that Israel was required to camp in a certain way around the tabernacle, in a rectangular fashion and oriented east to west. While the average Bible reader may struggle with the monotony of the descriptions, these details have not only helped to explain the theological underpinnings of Israel, but have also redeemed the tent tabernacle from skeptical scholarship of the 19th century that believed it to be imagined by a post-exile priest, in reality just a derivative of the temple to retroactively explain the worship system of Israel and justify the importance of an Israelite priesthood. But this theory has serious flaws. The tabernacle is only superficially related to the temple and does not appear to be derivative. And the tabernacle and its camp are very closely related to religious and military tents from the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC. A priest inventing the account in the Persian period would have reflected religious structures from their time. So what tent structures closely resemble the Israelite tabernacle? The research of several scholars has been instrumental in revealing the very ancient comparatives to the tabernacle that bring us decisively to Egypt. Portable tents were used for religious and secular purposes as early as Egypt's first dynasty. They served as places to conduct religious ceremonies associated with mummification, as demonstrated in tomb paintings and as evidenced by fragments of remaining poles and frames. 
The secular use of portable tent structures at this time were mainly for outdoor lounging, attested to by the gold-covered wooden rods and joints to a queen's pavilion discovered in her tomb. Closer to the time of the biblical tabernacle is the new kingdom of Egypt, when the use of tent structures had proven valuable in warfare. An amazing parallel to the tabernacle of God can be seen in the war camp of Ramesses the Great. Surviving illustrations show a rectangular camp oriented east to west with Ramesses' tent near the center. The tent is divided into a reception area and a throne room, remarkably similar to the layout of the tabernacle with its reception area and the Holy of Holies that housed the Ark with its mercy seat. The last known examples of Egyptian tents in this form and used for this purpose come from the 12th century BC, the biblical time of the judges. The author of the tabernacle accounts accurately describes a tent and camp of Israel that fits into a very ancient Egyptian context. Moreover, the Bible describes that Israel left Egypt prepared for war. Is it any wonder then that they would be arranged in a way that was familiar to them while installing God as their king and fierce leader? What's amazing about this organization of the camp is that it's as if God literally organized their, their physical being in the wilderness to tell the Israelites, I am your new king. Your allegiance, their allegiance wasn't even to be to Moses. It was to be to God. Now, this opens up our understanding then, because when the people rebelled against Moses, and they did it several times. They weren't actually rebelling against Moses, they were rebelling against God, because even with the very organization of their camp, it would have been clearly understood to them that God was their king, not Moses. So, you know, and, and this is substantiated when we get into Deuteronomy, and then when we get, you know, later on into the time period of the judges with the last judge, Samuel, when Israel asks for a king and Samuel's really upset about it, God says, you know, basically paraphrasing here, obviously, but he says, don't worry about it. They're not rejecting you as king. They're rejecting me as king. So there are many ways in these early books of the Bible that God establishes himself as king. And this is but one of them, but it's an interesting one. And it is interesting because the question then comes uh, when Jesus Christ returns uh, and he comes back to the earth in Revelation 19, it says actually that the Lord uh, dictates his judgment with the words of his mouth or with a sword coming out of his mouth. Right. And he rules and that's called the messianic rule. Now that's, that's. Or a, the millennial kingdom. The is millennial also another, kingdom. Like, yeah. It, term. But it fulfills the messianic rule. Right. Because when Jesus first came, he didn't rule. But what's interesting is that's the, that's what God was originally trying to do. Mm -hmm. When he set himself up as king, he was originally mm -hmm. trying to do that. And yet they couldn't, uh, they couldn't figure it out and they go through all this stuff and we go through Jesus Christ and finally, at the end of time, that's what we have when Jesus comes back. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think as, as as Christians, it's important to note that we're supposed to be living as if Jesus is our king. Exactly. Now, anyway, because, whatever culture yeah. you come from, whatever country you come from, doesn't matter. He's is the king Jesus, of kings. That's why when people say, you know, is Jesus your Lord, th their meaning is Jesus your king. Are you taking yes, your cues from Jesus? Are you, is he the one who's, you know, writing the law of your heart, writing mm -hmm. the law of your life that you're actually following? So that's it, something that... I mean, it really is really, directly applicable to us. It and, really is amazing. It truly is. And that also should make us pause and think about how that we should not elevate any one man or any one, one person. woman or mm -hmm. any one person or a group of yeah. people. Or even ourselves. Like I'm the captain yeah. of my own destiny. Oh, yes. Well, if you're a Christian, you're not. You're not. But that's you're what not. we do that's today. Right. We were in the TV yeah. commercials and the internet commercials mm -hmm. and everything tell us, you know, how we can be great and big in, in business. Yeah. And it's just our nature, right? It, it is. is. Like to it, put that's someone what business does. there, yeah. someone in yeah. charge of us, yeah. someone who we look to for hope. and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were we were bought with a high price, though mm -hmm. Jesus's blood and everything. Yeah. So yeah. we need to we need to live like it as well. Yes. We need to recognize that that God is the one; He is the source. And you know, people who have who are tied into business need to recognize that He is the one who's in control of everything, and He is the one who rules. Now, before we get to this, let me just say that on the next program Monday, we have why do we complain? Why? 
Why is it that we complain? We'll answer that question. Also, Corey has the weekend update and the read through of what we've covered. On YouTube. So on so YouTube, her me, channel. Look my channel up on YouTube. It's Corey Bobechko, C O R I E B O B E C H K O. <laughs> All right, now go ahead. And of course, we've lost our timer. Now we it's have back. it back. back. It's no, back. That's again. why we were trying to go really quick. That's there. right. So I thought, well, we'll just see how <laughs> fast I can read this question with 54 seconds left to go. go. I have chosen between Leviticus 9 and Leviticus 27 Ooh. in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. How many days were the children of Israel instructed to eat unleavened bread? Three days, seven days, or ten days? I what do you think? Seven. Yeah, it's definitely seven. Seven. Yeah. seven. And definitely. so you at home, I'm thinking of Bob and Cindy, I'm thinking of Marinette and Sinclair, I'm thinking of Benjamin, there are so many people that Diane, there's so many people that join along with us. If you said seven days, then you're absolutely Yay. right. The Leviticus 23, <laughs> verse 6, and on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread, only one of the recommendations set out by God for His children. You know, when it comes to the Lord, we can't do anything. We can't do any work to make ourselves right with God. Jesus does that. All we do is say, Lord, help me. But when God comes into our life and we have to move and we have to be active, we need to focus our attention on following Jesus Christ. And so when we do that, we say, Lord, help me to allow you to change my life forever and help me to work because of my faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, and we said together, amen.